you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangels call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let's pray with me. Dear Almighty God, our spirit seeks to align with your divine voice today. God, we pray that you soften, soften our hearts and enlighten our minds, preparing us fully to grasp the wisdom you wish to give us today. God, please bless us with your clear guidance, inspiring us to explore the depth of your 
word of God with open our open souls and eager hearts. Uh, please be with us until the end of this sermon. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I think uh, people love to hear the truth. Do you like to listen to the truth? Hear the truth, right? So shall I share a truth with you today? <laughs> so where does the sun rise and set? It, yeah, it rises in the east and sets in the west, right? This is the truth we know. However, that is not truth. The sun stands still, right? So it's only because the earth rotates that it seems the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. But the sun stands still there, right? So how do you feel faith in this truth? But you already knew it, right? Of course, for us this truth is already known, so we might not feel anything special about it. Maybe you think, uh uh, it wasn't right, right? Just you thought like this. But imagine, if I were to tell this story to an audience a thousand years ago. Many people would have accused me of lying or being mad because they believe the flat earth theory, right? The <laughs> earth is flat. But, and, and I might have received the response from the audience like that next he is going to telling us that the earth is round and the people on the bottom do not fall off. Right? <laughs> They would have thought like this. The point is that the important thing about facing the truth is not hearing the truth, but how one is able to react to and accept it. Right? That's more important things. We have to remember when we listen to the listen to the truth, right? In today's scripture, looking at Paul's story, he told the Thessalonians people. I do not want you to be informed. I, I do not want you to be uninformed. This means he want, want them to know the truth. He want to inform something important to the Thessalonians Christians. Therefore Paul said, Do you believe that Jesus died and rose again? Therefore we believe through Jesus God will bring with him those who have died. And one day, Lord himself will come down from the heaven. And at that time, those in Christ who have already died will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left on the earth, will be caught up in the cloud together. Not I cloud, right? Cloud. With them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. This is the point he wanted to share. This is the truth the Apostle Paul wanted to share again. Actually, here he it was informing the truth about those who died and still alive. For us today, this truth is fundamental, right? This is a very basic, basic truth we have to remember if we are a believer. But why did Paul explain it? Explain it again as if he is speaking to a child who knows nothing. There was a reason he had to speak again this truth. At the time, many, including Paul, held a belief in the imminent end of the world, convinced that Jesus would soon return and the world would come to an end soon. They especially hoped to ascend to heaven with Jesus in their lifetimes. However, Jesus didn't return, right? Externally, persecution continued, and internally, the number of believers dying before Jesus' return increased. These circumstances led to their first concern. Especially, questions began to arise about those who had already died among them. They might have this conversation. Hey Bill, Jesus said he would come back soon to take us to heaven. However, I heard Matthew fell sick and passed away just yesterday. Oh, Tom, I know. Did you know James recently passed away too? 
What happens to them? Matt and James believed in Jesus so passionately, but they passed away before Jesus' return. So, what happens if we die before Jesus is written like them? What happened? They just had this conversation. As this fear about those who died spread like a contagious disease, many started to worry about their own futures because they believed that they will go to heaven during the lifetime. They never think about the <coughs> death, you know, die before Jesus is written. That's why they felt fear. So cracks began to appear in the lives of these Christians. At the time, many of them believing in the imminent end of the world, loved one another, shared everything, and even sold their possessions to support the church and the mission for Jesus. However, as the anticipated return of Jesus appeared to be delayed, the Thessalonian Christians might have felt like they were enduring the longest customer service call ever continuously being told, your expected waiting time is soon, but there's no answer, right? They're waiting for the Jesus 10 years, 20 years, like they're waiting for the customer service. Oh, when will Jesus come? When will Jesus respond to our the future? But Jesus never come, came at the time. So, doubt, and regrets began to sneak in, leading them to question, do we really need to be this dedicated continuously? Do we have to support Jesus and Paul's mission continuously? The faith of those who had been eagerly anticipating an Im imminent ascension to heaven started to falter. They began rationalizing, if we don't know when Jesus will return, Perhaps it's acceptable to earnestly follow his teachings uh, starting tomorrow, not today, right? They just think, okay, tomorrow I will follow him. After tomorrow, I will follow him. And then the gap is more increasing, right? So it resulted in compromise between a worldly lifestyle and one that strives to please God. Actually, this line of thinking gradually pervaded their minds, leading to an increasing lift between faith and action. At the time, faith means action thing. But there was a gap, faith and action. They believe you just, but they don't do something. Right? So Paul especially advised them, do not grieve like the rest of others who have no hope of resurrection. This doesn't mean that Paul was instructing them to suppress their grief when mourning their deceased loved ones. Instead, the grief he mentioned symbolized, symbolized binding attachments that anchored them, hindering them from living in the hope of resurrection. So Paul was urging them to break, break free from these chains. So this was why Paul proclaimed the truth about Jesus and those who had died, urging them not just to hear the truth, but to respond to it again, achieving a life of true inner freedom. So I tried to regenerate Paul's, mess Paul's message not to grieve. So let's listen to his message again. Everyone, what fears or doubts do you harbor? Why did you say you believed in Jesus in the first place? Even if we die without witnessing the second coming of Jesus in our lifetime, if you believe in him and maintain that faith till your last breath, you will ascend to heaven. Let nothing stop you from living a life that pleases God. Stay awake, be vigilant, and continue living fervently for the Lord. Do not fail in living a holy life, a life pleasing to God by being anchored or attached to worldly elements like those who have lost the hope of resurrection. What prevents you from dedicating yourself? What causes you to halt in your tracks? Break free from all these chains. Faith is the vibrant inner force within you. Don't let your faith become mere knowledge. 
Yeah, this is what Paul wanted to say at the time. The sorrow he mentioned is not just kind of just feeling sorrow, grief, but it was the chain they had, preventing them to live as Christians. Dear my congregation, is this a teaching meant only for Thessalonian Christians? No, it is a message from Jesus for you and me. Every one of us experiences moments in our lives when we strive to love God and live a righteous life, right? These moments arise from our faith, burning brightly within us, but sometimes this flame is weakened. So what tends to extinguish the flame of our faith? What made it? Perhaps it is the weight of the life, challenging circumstances, relational conflicts, or moments when we confront our own weaknesses. Today, the scripture from the book of Thessalonians calls us to reflect upon our lives. It asks us whether we are anchored or attached to things that prevent us from living the life God desires for us. Everyone, does your, does your devotion stand still like a mere memory or snapshot from the past? Or are you continuously writing God's history in your lives with a burning passion? Do you still have the burning passion to follow Jesus? Have you ever thought, oh, back then I served the church so passionately? Oh, back then my heart was so fervent. Oh, back then I tried so hard to love God. Yeah, I usually think, oh, back then I had the burning faith at the time, right? But when exactly was back then? Childhood, youth, or just a few years ago or a few days ago? We must question if we have grown since that time or regressed, or whether we engage in continuously, continuous self-examination to ensure we are striving to be better than our past selves. Actually, our faith must liberate us to be free in the present, right? Being free means nothing can hinder us from living a life that please God. Once on my way to catch the subway, I encountered a homeless person begging. At the time, my own financial situation was not good, so I thought oh, I could not offer help. So as I passed by, on uh, him, I thought to myself, oh, we are both in the same difficulty, struggling with the money. So I, th I thought that I can help you when I am available. At the time, I just rationalized my inability to perform a good deed with a sense of self-consolation, self and I just continued on my way. However, when I came down the stair, a verse from a book of Matthew came to my mind. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And whatever you did not for one of these, one of the least of these, you did not for me. And I said, oh God, why you let me catch, grab that Bible verse? Mm -hmm. So actually, I grabbed it with my ego, because my ego asked me, yeah, just go. You don't have money too. You are all poor like him, so go and then, but the Spirit kept telling me that, yeah, you have to do something for Jesus. You have to do something for Jesus. So after greatly for a while, I went back upstairs, gave him all the money in my wallet, and then I headed down to catch the subway. But what I want to convey through this story is this. People, including me, often fail to act like Jesus when we need to do. And there are convincing reasons behind it. For me, my plausible personal situation, like not having money and the inner desire to simply pass by the homeless person, was significant barriers not to act like Jesus. These obstacles hindered me from living a life that delighted God. A multitude of reasons prevented us from being truly free to live fully for Christ. 
You might have had the similar experiences like me, where something holds you back, preventing you from making choices in the moment that would please God. At times, our failure in loving and helping others is driven not only by various circumstances, but also by immediate impulses of feelings such as laziness, depression, anger, frustration, or lack of interest to help others. If we continuously allow ourselves to be bound by these things, we inevitably live as those. Uh, we inevitably, inevitably live as though we have lost the hope of resurrection. That's why it's crucial to train ourselves in indifference. We need to cultivate indifference towards anything that binds us and prevents us from following Jesus. Training indifference to be active Christian anchored in the hope of resurrection is much like learning to dismiss spam emails. The indifference means just let it go, right? So have you ever received an email claiming that you won a lottery you never bought a ticket for? Yeah. <laughs> or an email asserting your bank account has been compromised? Oh, is it true like that? Maybe you must Resist the temptation to open these emails out of curiosity, right? Curiosity. So you didn't have to open that email. If you open that email, maybe the virus or something will invade your computer. So you have to rest your, the feeling to open, right? So that means we should be indifferent to such messages. Conversely, we must direct our attention to the true message, sidestepping the first temptation of sins. We need to stay attuned to God's truth and His calling, which empowers us to act for God, instead of succumbing to the silent cause of sin that hinder us. This is the way of the practice to be indifferent. So Apostle Paul says, you are our children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to night or to darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. My dear congregation, our existence, you know, your life is a journey of living with the hope of resurrection despite the constant challenges and trials. Paul's lesson to us is to break free from the shackles of darkness as children of light and to lead lives marked by a constant state of being spiritually awake. So, let me explain what is spiritual awaken, awakening. So imagine if God sends us daily notification like a smartphone. Yeah, God, can, God will give you the daily notification. Ta da! Time to pray. Ta -da. Hey, we still read your Bible now. Ta -da. This is the moment to forgive. And ta -da, it's time to serve. Just imagine you got a notification like this. But in truth, our inner selves often hear this kind of divine prompting. However, we tend to ignore it or choose not to follow it. Right? We all know God is sending the no notification in our hearts every time. So let's contemplate this. Oh, this notification cannot just be swiped away because it is a message from God. It is a message from God. This is the notification from God. This is the asking from God. This is the way we, have, we can be awake. We have to try to grab this message alarming in our you know, hearts. We all know the truth that Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you know this truth? Have you heard this truth? Do you believe it? No? <laughs> Do you believe it? Yes. Yes? Yes. Right. That's why you will never die. That's why, that's why you will never die. Our faith journey is a series of 
continuous reaction to this divine truth over an obstacle in and outside of our lives in order to please God? What is it that prevents you from responding to this truth and from living a life that pleases God? We all know the reason why I cannot serve Him right now. Why? We all know the reasons, right? We have the many reasons. Please recognize the barriers that hinder you, your righteous response to the truth, and please present these challenges to the Lord, for God is ready to liberate you. When we try to ask God our weakness, God will give you strength, and God will let you do something for God. This is who God is. So I pray fervently that your life will not just reflect, but resound with the truth of gospel that you shall never die. We have to try to respond to this gospel that you shall never die. May every action and every choice you make echo your deeper rooted faith in the hope of resurrection that Jesus assures. And I pray that you stand firmly on the promises of God which allow you eternal life. Amen. Dear my brothers and sisters, let us stand firm in the truth that our Lord is ever present. Let us be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in God's work. Our toil is not in vain. May our lives be a testament to God's enduring promises reflecting the hope of the resurrection. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the unchanging love of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, be always with all our congregations who decided, decide to joyfully carry out the work for the Lord by standing firm and waiting for the day we will be risen before Jesus Christ now and forever. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord and one another.